the first homework assignment is about um, just generally how you can represent sets. So set builder notation or using sort of the roster format where you list out the individual elements, that sort of thing. Um, but I also wanted to throw in some common number sets that do have a tendency to show up a lot in not just this homework assignment, but they're also in the next one a lot too. So right off the bat, just generally a set is a collection of objects. And I know that's very broad, very general, but really, I mean, that's the best thing that you can say because they don't have to be numbers, those objects. A lot of times they are, but you can have sets that consist of letters. You can have sets that consist of special characters and you can have sets that aren't just things that you can write, right? I mean, um, if you want to make that more general and you want to have like the set of houses that are on a specific block or something. Sure, you can say, well, that's a collection of objects. That would be a set. Although we're going to fo focus on ones where we can actually write them out. Um, so the first thing is the common sets of numbers. And if you'll notice all of the symbolic notation here, um, these letters look kind of bold or have like lines that are doubled um, within, I guess, the formation of the letter, something like that. And I think if I remember correctly, if you want to see what these are supposed to look like, um, like a typed version, if you have Microsoft Word and you go into the equation editor, I think they're under um, letter like symbols. So you have to go to like insert symbol and the default is just like the general, like I think like just like a general math one. And if you change that to letter like symbols, I think these are all in here. But by hand, this is usually the way they get written out. So the natural numbers, that does look like an N just with two vertical lines at the beginning of drawing the N. Um, and that's like your counting numbers, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. The whole numbers, basically it's just natural numbers, but you also would include zero. So that one's not a whole lot different. The integers, this is a little bit different. The other thing that's different is you think, well, why is that a Z? Why isn't that an I for integers? Because this was a W and this one up here was an N. The reason this is a Z, I think, is because the word for integer in German is Zahlen. So I think that's where it comes from. Um, but in any case, the integers, um, you can have negatives, right? Like that's the new thing now, right? You can see the negative one, the negative two, negative three, negative four would be there, right? Um, rational numbers, um, these you can't really enumerate because um, basically these are any numbers that could be uh, represented by a fraction. And between any two fractions, you could always find another fraction, right? Like between three fourths and one, you have seven eighths. But between seven eighths and one, you have 15 sixteenths, right? You could always do that. So that's why I had to write this one this way in, in set builder notation, which you can see here because you got the vertical line that functions as the phrase such as, which we're going to talk about a little more in a little bit. But the idea with a rational number is it's one that you could write as a fraction or as, um, I guess, either a terminating or repeating decimal. Um, what I mean by a repeating decimal is like um, if you put one ninth into your calculator, you're going to get a decimal point and then a bunch of ones, right? It's repeating ones. Um, but even something like if you put in one seventh, um, that's a repeating decimal. If you look at it in a calculator, it's a six digit phrase that repeats over and over. I think it's one, four, two, eight, five, seven, and, or eight, five, seven, or eight, five, six. It's one of those. And it just keeps going around and around and around. Um, but yeah, basically the A over B, and then it just says you can't have a zero on the bottom, right? So any, anything that you could write as a fraction, which would then also include integers because you could write any integer as that number over one, right? You can write four as four over one, right? That's more than you would usually write, but there's nothing wrong with it, right? It's still correct. So you could express it like it's a fraction or negative eight could raise negative eight over one, right? You can do those things. Um, irrational numbers can't be expressed as fractions. That's, you know, harder to come up with examples, even though in reality, there are actually way more of these but pi would be the most common one, right? You see that in geometry where it's roughly 3.14. But if you put pi into your calculator, you get a decimal that doesn't have like anything repeating. 
It just looks like a whole bunch of numbers. Um, same thing with radical two, and really any kind of square root where you take the square root of something that's not a perfect square. And so a perfect square would be something like four, where you take the square root and you get two, or like 25, where you take the square root and you get five. If you take the square root of something like two, so like if you put a radical two into your calculator, what you're gonna get is about 1.414, um, and then it's just numbers that have no discernible pattern after that, because radical two can't be represented as a fraction. Um, or as a repeating decimal, right? So what you get is a non-repeating decimal. Um, and then real numbers, um, I didn't put in the, uh, the symbol for that, I should have. Um, the irrational ones, you don't really see it too much, um, but for real numbers, so kind of like with natural numbers, if you're gonna write it by hand, it's an R for real numbers just with two stems for the R. Right, so kind of like the way you make the N for natural numbers. Um, let's see, ways that you can express sets, um, either using the roster method, and that's where you kind of have everything all itemized out and you write all the individual elements out. Um, so you have curly brackets, you put the elements in there, commas separate them, basically. Um, the order doesn't make a difference. Um, so it's not like they have to be written in increasing order or anything like that. If you have the set consisting of the numbers one, two, three, and four, but you write it as like one, four, three, two, let's say, that's completely fine. As long as you get the right numbers in there. And that's why I wrote this one intentionally a little bit out of order, just to say like, look, that's okay. It's fine if they're not in exact increasing order, right? You just have to have the right numbers in there. Um, and the other thing is there shouldn't be any repeats. So like if I had, like three, one, seven, five, nine, then a three and then a five, right? That extraneous three and five, you wouldn't want to have in there. So no repeats, right? No duplicates. Um, set builder notation. This is a little bit tougher if you've never seen it before, right? Like the roster method seems pretty straightforward. It's you just write out the numbers that are in the set, right? Um, but set builder notation, it's generally written like this, where we have a variable or expression, then a vertical line right here, and then some sort of condition or conditions. Um, the vertical line is read as such that. So I think this is easier to see with a concrete example. So let's say if we wanted to write out the set of all positive odd integers less than 10, which, oh, by the way, that's also what this is right up here. So that's why I picked it, so I can get these to match up. But there are a couple different ways you could write it where here we're saying, okay, x, right, there's our variable, um, where x is some integer. So this symbol right here that kind of looks like an e, that means is an element of. So this says x is an element of the integers, right, because there's that z, like that's the typeface version of the z that I have up above, where actually the one I did by hand kind of looks like it, which is the only case where it really looks good, to be perfectly honest, but it does kind of look right. Um, and we want odd integers less than 10. So I said, I want X to be odd and I want it to be less than 10. I also don't want it to be negative. So I said, well, if it's strictly between zero and 10, I'll take care of it, right? Because then odd numbers between zero and 10 are one, three, five, seven, and nine, right? Those are the positive odd integers less than 10. And it is also the set up here. The way that our homework tends to write these out is more like the second one because um, both of these mean the exact same thing. Um, and these aren't the only two possible ways that you could do it. There are more, um, but these are the two most conventional. And the second one is the one that our, I guess our open resource book and therefore the homework is gonna uh, favor. I guess that would be a good word. Um, so the way that they've got it written out you got that 2n plus 1, or if you want it to be x as your variable, you could have a 2x plus 1, right? The variable, it's just kind of a placeholder that you put in as the letter, but 2n plus 1, because it, whatever n is, if you double it and then add 1, that's always going to be odd, right? Because no matter what number you start with, when you multiply by 2, you always get an even. So then if you then added 1, you'd have to get an odd. So that forces it to be an odd number, 
But then if we're going to use this kind of format, we say, okay, well, we want integers. So I said, all right, well, if I just have um, n be an integer itself, so I'm saying n is an element of the integers, then we ought to be able to put some restrictions on n that get this to work. So we know what we're supposed to end up with as an answer. We know what numbers are supposed to be in that set, right? It's one, three, five, seven, and nine. So then basically what we got to think about is, all right, well, what value of n is going to give us the one? What value is going to give us the nine? And then everything in between should give us the three, five, and seven, right? So with 2n plus one, just looking at this, I said, well, then if we want to get one, we get that if n was zero, right? If n's zero, you get two times zero plus one, so that's one, right? So that's why I've got the zero as one endpoint here um, on this compound inequality. And then how do you get the nine? Well, I said, basically, and I don't have this written in, but I can kind of write it off to the side over here. What I did was I said, what if we wanted 2n plus one to be equal to nine? Well, in order for that to happen, basically you could just solve for n. So you subtract one from both sides, you get that 2n is equal to eight, and then say 2n over two equals eight over two, so then that means that n must be four. And sure, that works. Two times four is eight plus one is nine, right? So that's the biggest number that we had to get in our set. Um, and then one, two, and three, like if n is one, you're gonna end up with three. If n is three, you're gonna get five. And then, um, or no, if n is two, you're gonna get five. And then if n is three, you're gonna get seven. So that is kind of how you would derive this. Um, and you don't have to write this one with um, non-strict inequalities. You could write this with a strict inequality if you wanted. Like instead of less than or equal to four, you could have strictly less than five, right? Like there are slight variations that are still gonna work. And I think with the homework, when these sorts of things show up, you just have to kind of pick the right one out of a lineup. But like if it was write out this set, there are multiple right answers, right? So just be aware of that. It's not gonna be that there's one representation of the set that's right and everything else is wrong. Because then you could also say, even though the convention to get odds is to add one, what if you said 2n minus one? Because that would also always have to be odd. And if you do that, then that's gonna shift the bounds on what n could be, but you could do it that way, it's not wrong. It's a little unconventional, but it's not wrong. So my point is that there are a whole bunch of different right ways to write out a set like this using set builder notation. That's not always true. Sometimes um, it's a little more cut and dry where it's like, okay, there's only this one way you can possibly do it. But sometimes there are a whole bunch. This is one where there's a whole bunch. All right, getting down. Oh, right, right, right. I forgot about this before we get to the examples. Um, the difference between inclusively and exclusively because those show up in the homework. Um, basically, they have to do with the endpoints. So it's like, do you want to include your endpoints or do you want to leave them out or exclude them? And that's basically how it works. Um, so like I said here, it's like the difference between greater than or equal to and greater than. Because like a strict greater than, you don't include the endpoint, but with a greater than or equal to, you would, right? Like X less than two. You don't include the two there, right? Like that doesn't satisfy the inequality. But x less than or equal to two, then the two is going to satisfy the inequality, right? Because of the or equal to part. So um, it's either you include the endpoint or you don't. And that's what inclusively and exclusively are. So inclusively, you want the endpoint or endpoints, um, and then exclusively, you don't. So that's what I've got here. Right? If you want the set of all integers between 22 and 27 inclusively, so inclusively means include the two endpoints. You want to include the 22 and the 27 along with everything in between them. So that's what I've got here, right? There are 23 through 26. Those are ones in between, but you also want the 22 and the 27 when it's inclusive. You want to include the endpoints. But then between 22 and 27 exclusively, you don't want to include them. So it's just the numbers that are strictly in between. So just 23, 24, 25, 26. All right, now we can get to the examples. All right, so the factors of 12 used in, using the roster method. All right, so the roster method is where you just write out the numbers inside the brackets rather than using set builder notation. The first thing I guess would be to get the factors of 12. 
Don't even worry about writing it out using the roster method. So the factors of 12, I guess if you don't remember all of them right off the top of your head, um, you can figure them out, right? Because you can say, well, I guess the easy one would be to say that 12 would be 12 times 1. So 12 and 1 have to be factors of 12. That is certainly true. But you got some other options, right? You could say that 12 is 6 times 2. Or you could say that 12 is, let's say, 3 times 4. And that's actually going to cover it because the other ways that you could write 12 as a product, they look like these. It's just the order is reversed, right? Like 6 times 2 or 2 times 6, right? They're both going to give you 12. But, you know, switching the order doesn't give you anything extra because um, you just need the factors, right? And having duplicates you don't want anyway. Like if we're going to use the roster method, we're just going to throw out the duplicates. So we've got everything right now. So what this would look like if we were going to write this using the roster method. So I'm going to put these in order, um, which I mean, I guess, well, you don't have to. Maybe it's easier if I just go left to right and don't put them in order. So then I'd have 12, then one from that first one there, and then six and two. And then three and four like that. Um, or if you wanted to put them in order, you could. Um, so I guess I can just do that. So the order doesn't matter. So this would be the same set, right? And I'm just gonna say one, two, three, then four, then six, and then 12. That's what it looks like when they're all in order. Um, and I guess it wouldn't make a difference if you had to write this out. Um, in the homework, you won't. You just have to pick the right one out of a lineup. But um, I guess the one on the right looks a little bit nicer because it's in order, but they're both right. Next, positive integers less than 25, or positive even integers, sorry, uh, using set builder notation. Okay, so positive even integers. So even, we're going to be looking at 2, 4, 6, 8, and so forth. But if we got to be less than 25, we're going to stop at 24, right? That's the last even number that's less than 25. All right, so if we were going to use the roster method, so I just want to have this here as a reference basically. So let's see. For the roster method, if we were going to do that, I'm not going to write out the whole thing, but I'll write out part of it. We'd have two, and then we'd have four, and then we'd have six, and then we'd have eight, and then we'd have a whole bunch of other numbers, and eventually we'd get up to 24. Okay. Well then, if we go back up here for a second, where when we were writing out the odd integers less than 10, this way with the 2n plus 1, we're going to do a similar kind of thing, except uh, the 2n plus 1 is for odd integers, and down here, for even integers, it would just be a, like a 2n. So all these even numbers you could write as 2 times something, right? So like 2, that's 2 times 1. 4, you could write that as 2 times 2. 6, you could write as 2 times 3. Right? You, can, you can see what I'm doing here now, right? 8 is 2 times 4. Way up here, 24 is 2 times 12. Okay, so from there, if you were going to write this out in set builder notation, then if you're going to use like that 2n, or I guess I'll write it as 2x just to change it up, then the vertical line for such that, uh, we're going to want x to be an element of the integers. And judging by what's going on up here, the thing that we're doubling in order to get the 2, 4, 6, 8, and so forth up to 24, we need 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 12. So I'm just going to write this as 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 12. And then that will cover it. So that, I think, is the most direct way of writing out what that would be if you had to do it in set builder notation. Next one, 
all odd integers greater than 40. Okay, um, we can use the same sort of logic that we just used. Um, this one's a little harder, but it's a similar kind of idea. So if I did the roster method first, I won't be able to write out the whole thing because this doesn't have an upper bound. And we're gonna see that almost right away. But odd integer is greater than 40. You think, okay, well the smallest one's gotta be 41, right? So that's where we're gonna start. So we're gonna have 41, and then next is 43, and then next is 45, and so forth, right? So we're just gonna keep going and there's no biggest number in this set, right? It's just every two, you're gonna get another odd number. So it just keeps going and going and going. Um, and then uh, we can kind of do what we were just doing, um, except that these are odd numbers. So, so for odd, uh, I guess really it's odd integers. So I can, I can write that a little bit better. So odd integers would be of the form. I'll, I'll use an n again this time. So 2n plus 1 where n itself is going to be an element of the integers. And then we can kind of figure out, okay, well, how do you get 41? Because then we're gonna kind of end up with what we did here, where we're gonna have something that we have to double, and then we just gotta get a, a range for what those values need to be, right? For the things that we end up doubling. So how do you get 41, right? I think if we know how you get 41, we can probably do the rest of this, because that's the starting point and it just keeps going on forever. So if we can just figure it out on that one end, we should be able to do this. So if 2n plus 1 is 41, then this is actually kind of the same thing that we did on the first page, right? We're going to end up solving for n. So if we subtract 1 from both sides, we're going to get that 2n is 40. And then if we divide both sides by 2, we're gonna get that n equals 20. All right, so then what we know right now, and I'm kinda out of space, I should've written this up here maybe. So we know that if n is 20, then that means that, that's a terrible looking arrow, but I guess that's okay, that 2n plus one is gonna be 41, and then these numbers get bigger, right? 43, 45. So what if n gets bigger? Well, if n is 21, we're going to get the 43. Because then 2n plus 1, if you substitute in, 2 times 21 is 42. And then if you add 1, you get the 43. Then if n is 22, you're going to get 45 and so forth. So you could keep doing this if you wanted to. But I think just seeing this now, we probably have enough to get the right answer. So I guess I'll just put this down here. So the answer would be, and we're gonna use that notation with the 2n plus one. So 2n plus one such that n is an element of the integers and n needs to be at least 20. Right, so n greater than or equal to 20. Since 20 gave us that 41, which is the smallest number that's gonna be in that set, right? And then 21 will give us the 43, 22 will give us the 45. So if we go bigger than 20, we're gonna get values that work. So that's gonna be our answer right down there. So that one's a little bit tougher, um, but I think if, if something like this makes sense, um, you're probably in pretty good shape. Let's see, then number four, to express the set of perfect squares between four and 81 inclusively. Okay, well here you could do it either way, because notice it doesn't say, right? It doesn't say use the roster method, it doesn't say use set builder notation, but they're actually both gonna work. So 
we can do either one and notice these are perfect squares and you go okay well how do you get four by squaring it's two squared right how do you get 81 by squaring that's nine squared so that's actually a helpful little piece of information that two squared is four and then nine squared is 81. So we should kind of hang on to that piece of information because you go, wait a minute, then all the perfect squares between them would be what you get when you square numbers between two and nine, right? So if we we're gonna do this using the roster method, then we can write these all out and it's inclusive. So I am actually gonna write these in increasing order. But we're going to start with 4 because it's inclusive, so you include the endpoints, and that's 2 squared. And then you go, all right, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25, 6 squared is 36, 7 squared is 49, 8 squared is 64, and then 9 squared is 81. And that's our cutoff, right? So there we are. So that's one way of writing it. If you want to write it in set builder notation, you can. So I guess the way I have this phrased, it's kind of just like a preference. And I should have made that a colon, not an equals. That looks better um, right there. Um, but I guess in the homework, they would tell you, like, what does it look like in set builder notation? What does it look like um, using the roster method? So we know that these are squares. So I guess if you were going to write it in set builder notation, we could have that this was a square. So kind of like how for even and odd, where you'd have like the 2x or the 2x plus 1. For a square, you can say, well, it's some um, value x that's getting squared. And then such that x is an integer and... In order to get this set up here, x would have to be between two and nine inclusively. Since the two will give two squared will give you the four, nine squared will give you the eighty-one. So you end up with something that looks like this. I should also point out here that if you don't use z, you could actually use an n here and it's right. You could also use a w here and it's right. Because two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, not only are they integers, they're also part of the natural numbers and part of the whole numbers. So here, you know, those slight differences, if you use the different um, initial number set um, to work out of, you'd still get the right thing. That doesn't always work, but it works here, right? Because there aren't any fractions, there aren't any negatives, so you can do that. Um, all right, I wanted one that wasn't numbers and I wanted one where stuff repeated. So Mississippi was kind of the obvious choice, but this is actually kind of funny how short it is. Um, so the set of letters that make up the word Mississippi, I would just go through the word left to right and just kind of pick them out. Um, let's see, so there's an M, okay, that's in there. So might as well go ahead and put it in there. Then the next letter is an I, all right. And we're gonna need that. Next letter is an S. But then the letter after that is also an S, but we already have it, so we don't want to write it in again. And then we get a bunch of other repeats, right? The I, S, S, I, those are all repeats. P, that's a new letter. So put the P in there. But then the other P and then the I at the end, those are repeats. So this is actually the answer. Right? Because part of writing this out in, um, uh, you know, like using the roster method is that you don't want to have the repeats in there. So it's nice and short because Mississippi has a ton of repeated letters. Um, and I guess there is no way to put this in set builder notation, right? Like that's kind of a thing that's really for numerical sets, not for sets that are made of letters. Um, all right, and then six, express the set of real numbers between one half and radical two exclusively. Okay, so first thing with six, the phrasing looks like the phrasing for four. However, there's no way to use the roster method here because there's an infinite number of values between one half and radical two that are real numbers. And there's no way that you could list them where it would be obvious what came next, right? Like with the 
um, odd integers above 40, you can kind of do that. Because then you go, you know, 41, 43, 45, and you look at that and you go, oh, I get it. I get the pattern. The next one's a 47, right? But here you can't do that. So you're kind of forced to use set builder notation, but at least it's one that's really, really short. Um, the one new thing, I guess, is that this is real numbers. So you want X to be an element of the real numbers. So you want that big, bold R. Um, so X is a real number such that it's strictly between one half and radical two, right? Because it says exclusively here, right? So exclusively means you don't want to include the endpoints. So when I write out the condition, I'm going to have strict inequalities. So I'm going to have less thans, not less than or equal twos. So one half less than x, less than radical two. And that's about the only way you can write that one. Unless you're gonna use interval notation, which isn't really part of this. So um, if you were gonna write it in set notation, I think that's realistically about your only option. So this is one where there aren't a bunch of different right ways to do it, um, right? Like here it's kind of limited, but at least the one thing that's right is pretty short. So, so that's nice. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's gonna cover a lot of possibilities for what shows up in that first homework. Um, and I guess if there's anything that comes up in it that um, looks a little bit different where you get stuck, um, then uh, just email me and we'll figure it out.